One of my favorite animated cartoon series is Wonder Over Yonder. You might never have heard about it because it only ran for two seasons, but it has some truly incredible 2D puppet animation. And there's something very, very special about the stories. If you've never heard about Wonder Over Yonder, it, the story is centered about Wander, who is a super optimistic character who wants to help everyone in the galaxy. And he has his trusty, super badass pal Sylvia at his side. But there also is the evil Lord Hater who wants to conquer all planets in the galaxy with the help of his first commander, Commander Peepers. If you like super cartoony animation and you haven't seen it, uh, you need to stop watching this video and watch Wonder Over Yonder right now and then you can come back and we have a closer look at the animation and the story. So from a technical standpoint, Wonder Over Yonder is done in Toon Boom Harmony by Mercury Filmworks and they have done a lot of animation in a similar style. Very fluent stuff, um, very modern styles and you always doubt is this frame by frame animation or is this puppet animation? And for those of you among you who are doing puppet animation, it's probably good to know how do you do that? That it doesn't look like puppet animation. And the main ingredient, I think, is that they use a lot of very different poses. In um, in stiff puppet animation, if you think, for example, about, about South Park or Archer, um, where, you know, stiffness is just part of the style. You can see how they just modify the same parts, the same cutout parts a little. While in Wonder Over Yonder, they have different like views of the characters. They have frontal, quarter and side views and back views. They use a lot of pose to pose animation with very different poses. And then they use some very strong and cartoony lines of actions uh, in almost every pose, um, which is also combating the stiffness that a lot of uh, 2D rigs have. They also try to bring flow into the motion whenever possible. They uh, sometimes have moments where the character is just going along the path of some flowy curves and some flowy lines. And this is something that is not easy to do with puppets because, you know, you need to bend the puppets along these paths, but it pays off in that it makes this very fluent and energetic impression. Another really cool thing is that they use very extreme shapes, especially extreme mouth shapes. Um, a lot of limited puppet animation, when they do mouth shapes, they just have, you know, this, this small area of the mouth where they're just a bunch of different different shapes in that confined mouth space. But in Wonder Over Yonder, the mouth sometimes takes over the whole face. They're showing the face and the mouth and the hand from different angles. And that also, again, breaks the stiffness and adds a lot of cartooniness. Of course, there are some things that you can't do with the rig and you have to redraw or draw these, these extreme shapes. But again, it gives you a much better impression. And that leads us to the other point that occasionally there are real drawings in there. If they need a smear frame for a really quick action, for example, they would uh, switch off the rigs or part of the rig and redraw that that um, just that limb or the entire character doing some crazy cartoony smear action, which is really cool. And then a the thing about the poses in general, there are a lot of distorted squash and stretches every now and then that probably also take a lot of work to mold the character rigs into these uh, extreme poses or, you know, maybe even redraw parts or the entire character. Um, but it takes it away from the stiffness once more. One crazy discovery I made is how little transition they sometimes have between poses. Sometimes there's not even an anticipation and maybe just a tiny bit of an overshoot. Or the only thing gluing two poses together could be the overlap of a secondary element. And it already works. What kind of surprised me when I had a frame by frame look at Wonder Over Yonder is that they 
don't always hide that there's a puppet like there are clear moments where it's just one body part being animated and the other st uh, parts are completely still or you can see stuff like rotating around a fixed point i do a lot of Toon boom harmony rigs myself and a big problem is always the shoulder area where you sometimes can't have the shoulder flow into the arm as much as you want to do it um, and there are, there are parts where they didn't even try to connect those two parts where you can clearly see that the upper arm and the shoulder are different cutout parts but I guess in the overall animation you just don't care and this was a very important lesson for me because you know sometimes if the animation is fun and energetic enough uh, it doesn't hurt if you have a little bit of the puppet cutout style showing through now you might be wondering why are they doing that why are they not making i mean they obviously are inspired by frame by frame cartoons why are they not doing the entire series frame by frame and uh, well one of the big things is probably productivity with a pre-made rig uh, while you cannot cover all cases that you need to take your animation towards, um, you already have a lot of elements that you can reuse and you don't start from scratch for every single shot. Just when you load the character into the scene, you already have the character there, it's colored, and you're already a few steps ahead in the production. But what I also thought was interesting is that they fully embraced the advantages that they have uh, by using puppet rigs. The advantage of using puppet rigs that you interpolate is that you can do very slow motions. Um, in frame-by-frame -frame animation, those are kind of hard to do because you need to draw so many frames. In puppet rigs, you might just set a couple keyframes and you have the same effect. And this makes Wonder over, uh, over Yonder like a dance with mixes of snappy pose-to-pose -pose actions, very fast and fluid motion, complete stillness, and very slow motion. And they try to use those different types of motions, those different types of possibilities that they have to make situations more fun and more interesting whenever they can. So one of the biggest ways of how they do it is by contrast, by contrasting different rhythms, different pacing. Hello! Hey there! Or by contrasting different types of content and they either deliver the funny things with a pause i have but one thing to say i've given all i can or very quickly like almost too quickly see Sil, an enemy is just a friend <laughs> hey careful careful there's a honeydew here man and in many episodes, they nail this. They have like the perfect feeling for the beats of the story and the comedy, which I think is very, very difficult to pull off. The series is written through very detailed storyboards. They don't have the step that somebody writes a full script and then they think about how do we translate that into images. No, a lot of the times they jump right into storyboarding and that helps them of course it's a lot easier to do visual and timing gags because you already see how they play out you can already assemble animatics and see very early on will my joke work with this timing will it be more funny with this timing i really recommend to you watching the series you now know what to look for and whenever they do something crazy or interesting pause it and watch it frame by frame. You gotta find some amazing poses in there, some amazing frames, uh, some some very creative and interesting way to time things. Yeah, basically this is just a gold mine for anyone who wants to go into comedic storyboarding and comedic animation. So now I wanna have a look with you at the question, what is special about the way that they do stories? And interesting thing for me about wonder over yonder is that it has 
first of all, it just feels very heartfelt. It feels the characters feel very real and really relatable. And then the other effect that the series has for me is that the rewatch value is so incredibly high. I could watch an episode of Wonder Over Yonder and be like, I want to watch that exact same episode again. Um, I don't know if that is just because I love the animation so much and I, I, I just, you know, like seeing all this craziness going on on the screen. Um, but I noticed that some, some other series I love, they don't have the same effect for me. For example, I love Steven Universe, but when I think about rewatching it, I'm like, that's a lot of episodes and I don't know. <laughs> and for Wonder Over Yonder, it's just like, oh yeah, I could watch this episode again. Yeah, so this is one of the reasons why I wanted to do this analysis, to find out what it is that catches my attention again and again and again, besides the animation that is really amazing. <laughs> so let's go super bird eye view and think about what this, the stories of Wonder Over Yonder are about at its core. And it's usually wonder helps people like that is something that the whole series is built around and um the the ways in which he helps or the problems that he helps with are very different like in one episode he could stop an invasion of a villain in another episode he has to return a lost sock or he wants to buy a drink for his friend sylvia so the range from like an everyday problem to a super epic story is enormous and um, it brings a lot of variety to the series. They also take a lot of these things to a very silly extent, like even more silly than you could ever imagine. The, uh, the Lost Sock episode is one of my favorite episodes and it just goes so over the top. That is a lot of the fun, um, seeing something uh, completely escalate, I guess. The other thing that is very important, a very important core ingredient, not just for Wonder Over Yonder, but I think for very uh, many comedies, is the whole, the situations, they are silly and funny to us, but they are serious for Wonder. So the big takeaway here, if you want to make cool comedy that is, uh, you know, that already has a little bit of deepness is a good comedy is funny for us, but usually very serious for the character. We laugh about the character dealing with that uh, serious situation, taking that serious situation to, to extremes or to, to places that are funny for us. Wonder is not the protagonist that is making a change. He is a static main character. And this is not something that is super rare. If you think about uh, Wally, for example, from the Pixar film, he's also very static and he's causing uh, Eva, Eve to change. And something similar is happening here within a story. It's usually a side character, um, often Sylvia, um, or even the audience who learn the lesson and to have to change the thinking along the way while the story is unfolding. Then another big component, I think, is the place and the situation that the characters are thrown into. And um, they kind of experiment with some very risky, high concept ideas from time to time that often work and uh, to a hilarious, amazing its extent, we're gonna talk about the split screen episode later on, which is, I think, an um, um, amazing example for a daring idea that worked out brilliantly in the end. Now, some of the situations that the characters are thrown into, they are all super different. Like sometimes there would be a planet of super happy beings that are suppressed by Lord Hater. Sometimes the episode would be on Hater's ship. Uh, in one case, it's in a gas station store, the entire episode. Um, there's an amazing episode with a creepy abandoned ship. And in one case, they even are in nothingness, a blank white background, and it's just Wanda and Sylvia, and it's an amazing episode. <laughs> I think the big takeaway here is how the characters react 
to, in, to the environment is a huge part to the comedy and the story. And um, in this case, it can even be a huge part of the lesson, I think, how the characters treat the galaxy um, and the inhabitants of the galaxy is part of the deeper level of these stories. On the surface level, the, uh, the series tells us what it is about all the time. Wonder says it never hurts to help all the time. He says an enemy is just a friend you haven't made yet. But interestingly, I think this is only a surface level. Um, and in a way, they are being, although they have these extremely pre preachy catchphrases, they uh, usually are not preachy at all. And there's something deeper to these catchphrases. And I think this is a lot due to the, the fact that entertainment and fun uh, of the cartoon is always the focus. You usually don't find yourself asking, uh, will wander win like this is not the the question that we're wondering about we just want to see how hilarious this will end or to what extremes this simple premise will go there's one episode where lord hater listed wander as his emergency contact and like just this premise you just want to see the fun and the chaos and you want to see that unfold and ironically, this is an episode that has a lesson in the end for Wonder. On the deeper level, I think Wonder Over Yonder is always negotiating optimism versus cynicism. It's about how we all see the same world, but how we take and want different things from it. And this gives some episodes a surprisingly deep message. One of my favorite episodes is the breakfast episode that I already mentioned. And it's so special because the entire episode has a split screen with one half of the story following Wander and the other half of the screen following Hater. If I think about if I were given to do that, this would be an extremely challenging uh, task for me. And so let's have a closer look real quick at how they pull this off without overwhelming the audience. The biggest thing that they do here that is very important if you have a lot going on in, in any cartoon, it doesn't have to be a split screen episode, but that you alternate where the action is going on. If you want your viewers to look over there, the other part of the screen needs to be st almost completely still. Um, and you know, then you can shift the attention just if you have two characters don't let them both do whatever at once but you know the one character does his thing then the other character reacts while the the first character is being a little more still and you need to direct the attention in that way and then what the, i think was very interesting to make this a very elegant experience they were leading the eye sometimes they would take a motion from one side of the split screen into the other side um and I think this this is a very clever technique. Um, if you want to use that in your cartoons, uh, you could use that between cuts. Like if you cut something um, and it, it goes into the same direction, the motion goes into the same direction, both cuts, it will make the cut a lot more invisible. They did a similar motion on both sides, or they would even do exactly the same thing. I'll do it myself. But let's step back from animation analysis back to the bird's eye view. Yeah, we, we were talking about the lessons of Wonder Over Yonder, and a big core part of it is Wonder's optimism and his attitude that you can and should help everyone. What I think is interesting about Wonder, uh, his optimism doesn't come from being naive. Um, for example, if you think about SpongeBob, he's really he doesn't have a care in the world because he really doesn't know any better. And at first, you think that it is the same case for Wander, but as the season progresses, we find out that he's actually he he is experienced. He turned villains good before. He knows that it it works, and he knows that 
almost always his um, optimism and his try of to help people will pay off. He doesn't act from a place of being being stupid. He acts from a place of knowing how things play out in the long run. And this, I think, brings us to the core that actually makes Wonder Over Yonder special. I actually heard it from the creator himself in an interview. He says that for Wonder Over Yonder, they started with the personalities first. They were doing that. They were creating the characters first and then thinking about what situations they could throw these characters in. Of course, they were also tweaking the personalities to be more contrasty and, uh, you know, to be more interesting together. But they started with the characters, with Wander's character. What would be an interesting character uh, that you could throw into all these different situations and to have uh, some very interesting stories unfold? And then they thought about the concepts that they could put around it. As for the characters you have, they are very clearly defined and all of them have very relatable uh, qualities. You know, both evil and good characters alike. We can um, have a space for them in our heart. We can relate to them. We can like them. We have Wander, who is this very idealistic, passionate optimist. Um, and yeah, his 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 character mission is he helps no matter the cost. And then to balance this, to actually have a little bit of a coin, counterpoint to him, um, we have Sylvia, who is protective, a lot more realistic, a lot more practical than Wander, often frustrated by Wander doing the impossible things. And she sometimes even is battling inside of her um, finding the right way, doing the right thing. Then you have Hader, who is a destructive, insecure and impulsive character who justifies doing the wrong thing for reaching some kind of praise and attention. Uh, on his side, you have Commander Peepers, who is uh, kind of mirroring Sylvia. He is a protective for Led Hader. He is trying to be realistic and more practical practical for the evil things that Lord Hader does. And um, he's also frustrated by Lord Hader doing whatever he wants. But then he also has this evil side, you know, that he's selfish, that he's doing things not for the good of the galaxy. And this is some, something that the show actually plays with. We have some episodes where uh, Sylvia and Peepers acknowledge their similarities and even join forces. And then we have Lord Dominator, who is opening a very interesting, different side of being destructive. Like she's destructive like Hater, but unlike Hater, she is self-confident and she doesn't do it for praise. See, she just does it because she wants to do this. This constellation is just very interesting because it always has conflict, even on the same side. Uh, Sylvia will always have a problem with Wander just going into danger, wanting to help people. And Peepers will always have a problem with Hater being so impulsive. And then you have the episodes where evil and good are actually meeting. And then, you know, it gets the, the, the possibilities are endless of how these characters could clash or even work together. And I think this is the strength here that the show is not judgy about these uh, these traits, you know, bad traits in the show can even be understandable and relatable. The whole concept of Wander seeing good in, in Hater and trying to find out why he is so evil and what he can do to make him good shows that, you know, being insecure is something that can be taken uh, to a bad extent, but uh, it is also something that can be fixed and can be made good. Um, and it also shows in a couple of episode, episodes that good traits can be problematic. Wonder going to, to like any extent and any extreme to help people can actually put them in great dangers. And sometimes his passion almost gets like, like a manic obsession um, that doesn't work out and that he has to come down from. So it's interesting how it is deeper in that way. Uh, and then sometimes there's a second level to the characters. Bad guys can turn out to be heroes 
or wonders can can very rarely but sometimes fail or even decide to break the rules that he usually uh, follows so strictly and then one other thing that i think was very good to see in the show uh, is the way of how they portray uh female characters um sylvia clearly is a badass but she also has this very caring maternal side for wonder so she is not just a a um a female character written like a male character that can fight like a male character but she also has this female side to her and then there is lord dominator um who's actually the the most powerful character in the series like there's no one more powerful than her but she is still very feminine and can be very seductive but is also so extremely independent yeah it's just just really fun to see how it breaks those stereotypes uh, in this very enjoyable and light way Another thing that I really enjoyed in the show are the meta elements um, and meta elements that is something that is existing outside of the story. It's acknowledging tropes or, uh, you know, playing with the medium that is not inherent in taking place inside of the story. Ah, animation is so hard. People who do this for a living deserve more credit and respect. And then one thing I always enjoyed very much were the horror episodes. Yes, they have horror episodes. Uh, don't worry, they're all very fun and, and cartoony and, you know, they're still for children. But the people clearly saw films like Alien or, you know, some, some horror film tropes and adapted them in a, in a children-friendly way that is still so incredibly suspenseful. Uh, it's amazing how they, how they found this balance. And um, yeah, you should definitely check those episodes out, like The Gifting 2 and uh, the episode where they are on the abandoned spaceship and it's almost like an alien situation. There even is a moment where Sylvia honestly thinks that Wander is dead and she is playing it real like the voice actress is really playing like not ha oh this character died but she's like really devastated <laughs> and um it's harmless because we know that he isn't dead but um i think it's very very cool for a cartoon show to take itself serious it is so serious uh, silly and surreal but it's taking those characters so incredibly serious. Uh, I think that is what it is at the core a lot of the times. Um, let's think what else is there meta. Um, there is there are some twists around learning lessons in cartoons um, that I thought was very refreshing, you know, where uh, uh, the episode is heading in one direction, but then turning at the very last minute to go somewhere else and being like, haha, we, we don't have this preachy message for you. We have another preachy message for you. For example, they, they really do some fun uh, stuff with that. Yeah, so this is my take on it. There, I could talk about this even longer, but now I want to hear from you. Have you ever watched the series? Um, what are your favorite episodes and moments from Wonder Over Yandra? I want to hear from you in the comments below. If you like this video, please uh, share, subscribe, leave a comment. And I can't wait to talk to you next time.